Ralph, calling in at 8 a.m. from Canada. How is it like over there? It's great. Weather's getting better. Uh, we just came back from a lot of cold over the past few months, so now it's getting nicer and spring is starting to shine. You know, mm -hmm. April flowers bring May shower or May flowers. I think it's, it's saying how it goes. So we're, we're pretty excited for the new season. Nice. Okay. Very cool. And are you planning on staying in Canada? Are you happy with the conditions there, or do you think of moving somewhere else? Definitely think of moving. I mean, there's a lot more potential out there. I would say in terms of being around more competitive people. I spent about January in Dubai, and uh, I was spending some time with some family members and friends, and just understanding. The competitive landscape there and um i was you know it wasn't my first time i, I usually go every few years but um uh, you know there's a new energy that seems to be around there um especially in the gulf gcc area around you know uh, the free market and you know business opportunities it seems to be vibrant right now so definitely thinking about other opportunities out there uh, it really depends on uh different life circumstances but definitely something uh, that we're considering very interesting. Okay. So what is it that you do? So I work in tech sales. Okay. And are you comfortable revealing any more on that? Or would you prefer to keep the rest confidential in terms of uh, tech sales? So software, uh, e-learning platform. That's probably the most I could say for now. Yeah, sure. So, and how did you get into that? So I started my journey in tech sales about five years ago. Uh, worked for a, a small startup. Always loved working for small startups. Um, and then in about 2019, I started my own e-learning company focused on helping Gen Z and millennials, uh, uh, find skills for their careers. Uh, the business didn't do too well, so it failed after about 18 months and we shut it down, but that led me to joining, uh, a fantastic e-learning company. It's pretty well known, uh, globally and, uh, you know, things have been good ever since. Nice. And how did the real world help you in your tech sales position? Well, I think it really comes down to understanding what resources are out there, right? So let me give you a story. When I first wanted to get into uh, tech sales, I was working in management consulting. And what I really wanted to know is, okay, what are the skills that I need to figure out how to get into tech sales? What are the things that I'm going to be doing? Went over to Udemy. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Udemy. And, uh, you know, started taking a creative writing course and it was pretty good actually. And, uh, every time I realized I needed to learn something, I would go online and I would find a, a skill. So I guess the real answer that you would probably want to think of this is what is it that you want to learn when you go to the real world and you want to figure out, okay, what are the skills that I need to get from here to here? The real world offers a unique set of skills that probably doesn't really exist anywhere else. So when I wanted to figure out, okay, I want to get from an employee or a tech company, I want to go now into, you know, being a successful, uh, you know, entrepreneur or even maybe a successful intrapreneur. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the difference. Uh, entrepreneur is basically uh, entrepreneur DNA, but works within a small group of people uh, as opposed to being starting it on his own or maybe perhaps uh, focusing on it uh, uh, on his own. So that's just a vague difference. But, uh, entrepreneurs are very much entrepreneurial. They like to work in maybe, maybe they will be employee number 10 of a company or employee number 12 of a company. But entrepreneurs are very much one, two or three first few people who start a company. Anyhow, that's a, just a side note. But going back into it, if you take a look at what it is that you really want to learn uh, in the real world, uh, one of the things that stood out to me very clearly was the business mastery. Personal finance was, you know, detached from business mastery, but those skills that you're learning uh, that was in business mastery. So the storytelling, uh, learning about speed, learning about, uh, you know, certain how to build relationships that you don't really find in its uniqueness anywhere else. You know, everything else is more so generic focused on, uh, you know, I would say the standard cookie cutter type of learning. And so when I joined the real world, I, I, I'll be frank with you, Rokas, I uh, joined it out of uh, skepticism. I said, you know, how is there 10,000 or 20, 200,000 people 
in this platform. I said, wait, is that actually true? Is there 200,000 people in this program? And I, I thought it was, you know, kind of a scam. And then I, and I said, wait, if you have 200,000 people paying for a product, that's not a scam. That's product market fit. I have to check this out. And so I checked it out and I said, okay, what are the skills that are really keeping people here? And those were exactly the skills that I needed personally for taking my life from here to here. So um, it helped me tremendously with being able to close more deals, it helped me tremendously with building stronger relationships with people within the company, outside of the company. Um, and so that's basically my answer in a nutshell. It's like, you want a unique set of skills that only exist in the real world. And it's like, it's like the dark night of skills in the skills world, right? Um, and those are, in my opinion, the most valuable today because they're the most traditional, well thought out skills um, that aren't really uh, offered out in uh, in its entirety. All right, and I love hearing the cat in the background as well. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I uh, no, 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 no sorry, yeah, it. it's cute. Okay, so why fifty dollars for all that value? What do you think? You know, I have a theory about this. Uh, I would actually say it's worth a lot more than $50. Of course. Right? Okay. So let me, let me give it to you this way. I think every single person who ends up really doing something significant in the world, let's talk about Elon, let's talk about Steve Jobs. When they do something significant in the world, they do it because of a deep pain that they went through growing up. A deep challenge that they ultimately wanted to solve for the world. You take a look at Tate's life, right? This, this is what really got to me, by the way. You look at Tate's life, and you could technically say he was amongst the disenfranchised growing up, him and Tristan. They were part, They grew up in South Side Chicago, moved to Luton. Those are tough areas. Like, that is by no means an uh, easy way to grow up. And I think, you know, as uh, Andrew and Tristan were starting to think about their lives and their futures, they grew up in struggle, right? They had a fantastic, you know, for, I just hear from the stories, of course, a fantastic genius father who was, you know, financially crippled, I would say, a mother who was financially crippled. He had a fantastic desire to become successful. Obviously, he went into the fighting route, but probably around the age of 60 and 17, he was thinking, okay, how, what's my career like? What is my life going to be like? And he got to a point where he said, wait, why would I pay $50,000 or $100,000 and go to school and pay the next 10 years paying that off or you know, work the next 10 years paying that off only to be making minimal dollars and working for someone else? And so I don't think that was the life that he wanted. And I think that really frustrated him that, okay, I don't have the opportunity to go to maybe an Ivy League school and have it paid for by my parents and but at the same time, I really want to become wealthy and be successful in the world. So what do I do? Okay, he went into the fighting route and he, you know, we know him as becoming successful there. But the problem that he really wanted to solve is economic access and equity for people. That's my theory. And so he could have easily priced it at $100, $200, $300 a month because most of the people who are going into this program or this, this uh, uh, you know, environment, they're coming out with tremendous amounts of money. I mean, I saw it. I saw it from my own eyes. I didn't believe it. I saw it from my own eyes, people showing screenshots of money that they're making in, in the campus. And so you could probably charge, you know, 10x the price because the people are getting 10x the value. But I think, I don't think that's really what he wants to do. I think what he really wants to do is create equity and economic opportunity for everyone, the economic opportunity that did, he didn't have growing up. So that's why I think it, it's priced at 50 bucks. Um, it's, it's because he wants to price it just fairly enough where if you pay for something that's not free, you'll actually take it seriously because you're investing in it. If you give it for free, no one really does it. Like I kind of learned that on my own in my own e-learning company when you, I was giving things away for free. But at the same time, he doesn't want to create a world where only a select few can have access to opportunity. So I think it's a remarkable reason as to why he's pricing it at $50. This is just like my, it's like, 
uh, psychologic an, an assessment or analysis of it. So I could be totally wrong in my assessment, but I don't think it's about making money for, for Andrew. I think it's more so about creating the opportunities that he didn't have growing up. That's hmm. why it's priced at $50. I mean, I would completely agree with what you said. And I also want to say you're a great speaker. You put your thoughts very coherently. And yeah, as I said, I would I would agree with what you said. So for people who are thinking it's a scam, what do you think that is? And how different was your expectation, as in reality from expectation, what you expected going in? Were you thinking it could be a scam as well? Of course, absolutely. I mean, I come I come from the the, uh, the white collar world, right? So I'm not like your average person who's joining the real world. Uh, now, am I entrepreneurial? Absolutely. Uh, do I uh, want to uh, learn skills, you know, outside of the real world? Yes, I absolutely still do, and I you know take those skills pretty seriously. Uh, you know, I went to university, graduate university. Uh, not that I totally agree with that route for most people, but I did. It is the reality of it. My, I was privileged enough to go through it without collecting any debt. Um, but that's a side note. So when I was joining the real world and I, you know, kept hearing all the memes of the real world, it's like, you know, I'm actually really curious about this because if there's 200,000 people joining this, like I gotta, I gotta go see this for myself, especially as someone who uses other platforms. And I wanted to know what, how are people so engaged? How, how do you get 200,000 people so engaged? And I was in the campus and I was looking through like the feeds and it's like a combination of Reddit, combination of, uh, you know, a fantastic e-learning company, you know, all the top e-learning companies. I, I don't want to name them out here, but it's a combination of that. And then a combination of, uh, you know, results, right? People are proving results. So initially when I joined, I thought it was a joke. It's like, hey, let's see what people are really learning about this. Like, is is this actually something that people are taking seriously? But but no, it was it was it was remarkable what I saw. It's like an actual online university that people go to um, to learn the skills that they need for entrepreneurship, for you know, creating wealth, but even also things that you can use in your career. That was what really got me to think about the impact of, of the platform. So yes, to answer your question in a short way, I absolutely thought it was a scam. But then when I saw 200,000 people paying, I'm like, this is product market fit. You have a fantastic product here. And then when I saw the results of the people, I said, okay, wait, there's something here. I should probably keep digging a little bit. And then I started actually learning the content. I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. And I started applying it. like. Simple things like, you know, how you speak, how you present yourself, taking pauses, the power of storytelling, like that alone was a life changer for me. Whether I'm talking to someone, whether I'm, you know, meeting with an executive, whether I'm uh, being able to, you know, just meet a random person that, you know, creates a new opportunity for me, like at some type of networking event. It really changed the game for me. Um, and here's the other thing, by the way, that I think is super underrated about it. If you take a look at the problems in the world today, depression, mental health, we're in a crisis. One of the things that people don't understand about why we're in the crisis, there's a really good book, by the way, I strongly recommend it. Uh, it's from a author called, uh, jo uh Joan Hari or Joan Hari, uh, it's called uh, Deep Connection. It talks about the reasons why we're depressed and anxious. If you take a look at the main reason why the younger generation is deeply anxious, deeply depressed, is because they don't have a sense of community or they don't have a sense of belonging. And what really stuck out to me about the platform was there's a real community of people, like the same way you would go to school and find people that you get along with, either in a fraternity or sorority for your female or, you know, in a, you know, a classroom environment. Like I know in, when I was in university, the engineering folks really love to be buddy, buddy with one another. And it was like a known as a brotherhood, like people are on this platform and they're actually part of a community 
and they feel like they have an identity for themselves, which is like, hey, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm someone who really has ambitions. And that alone solves an enormous amount of problems for folks who perhaps are amongst the disenfranchised or even folks who just want to you know, break out of that plateau that they're in, in their careers, or perhaps, you know, they are, uh, they're subscribed to a certain set of understandings about the world and about business. And they want to, you know, expand their horizon so they can find new opportunities. So I would say that alone was something like, just as someone who really wants to see the world go into a, a better place, like I was fascinated to see that this actually solves a lot of the problems amongst the youth. It was, it was something that really shocked me. So I did think it was a scam. I did think that it was a joke in the beginning because I was watching like some of the memes and some of the content about Andrew Tate. And, you know, one of the things I think they really did a disservice on was, you know, putting out small clips because I would watch the small clips. What, what, what is this guy saying? Like, this is just outrageous. What, and then, I said, and then I started actually watching his long form content. And I was like, whoa, this is a very intelligent person. This person understands the world in ways that we need to you know, really pay attention to because he's saying the things that is in the back of our minds, but maybe it's not, it's not you know, expressed uh, out of you know, lack of understanding or whatever it may be as the reason why it might not be expressed. I don't want to put reasons out there for folks. But we started, he started saying it. And we start understanding why he's saying it. And we realize that, wait, he actually helps others, you know, formulate their thoughts in a coherent way. Oh, and he's actually creating a community of folks to really believe in themselves. And that alone was something that I thought was really worth emphasizing about amongst what he was doing. So then I said, okay, well, let me just check out this platform. It must be a joke. And then I, it reassured some of, some of my thoughts. It's like, a lot of success comes from being confident, right? But if you're amongst, like if you're an 18 year old and you don't really have access to opportunity, what are you confident about, right? You don't really have much to be confident about. You don't even know your identity. You don't even know who you are. And so you join this platform. Now you have all these things. Someone's teaching you how to actually have faith in yourself, uh, how to really think things through. And I think there's other ways to get that as well, right? But I guess it, like it, like I was saying earlier, it's it's about access. How do you get access to that, right? Um, a really important piece of information uh, that came my way, actually not too long ago, that really made me think about things differently, is a concept called the power of proximity. So the power of proximity is essentially everything you know about your life, okay, is stem from your subconscious. That we know, uh, there's a really good book on that called the, the the Power of the Subconscious by James Murphy. Um, but the power of proximity is basically an understanding in that where it's your environment plays a huge role in your subconscious, but it also plays a huge role in what you believe in yourself and what you believe in your po in, in 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 what is possible. So I'll give you an example of this. Let's just say I grew up in a really difficult neighborhood. The people that I looked up to were people that probably had, you know, uh, criminal activity or perhaps, you know, had difficult opportunity growing up or, you know, not very wealthy. But I bump into a millionaire and I look at him and I start asking him questions or her questions. And now I'm trying to understand them a little bit more because I now bumped shoulders with that person. I now see what is possible amongst a whole new subset of people, wealthy people, millionaires, billionaires, whatever you want to call them. And because I'm close with them now, I now see this possible for myself. The power of proximity is basically how close I am to someone, right? Is what I believe is possible for myself, right? So if I'm close to a really strong, uh, eloquent, successful group of people. Well, I now know that that's possible for myself, even if I'm, if I'm the worst amongst them, right? I know that that's possible for myself. That is something that I realized was happening in the real world. And that blew my mind. I was like, whoa, I got to really pay attention to this. Even if it's for my own learning about what else is out there, 
I really had to. And I just kind of started going through some of the content. And I was like, whoa, maybe I should restart my business that failed. Maybe I, oh, this is why I failed. Oh, wait, if, if I did this, things would have been different. And look, I'm not the type of guy who loves to, likes to say, oh, could have been, should have been. It is what it is. And it happened. But I started realizing my mistakes in my entrepreneurial journey. And that alone was what really got me to stick around. It's like, wait, there's something here. You got to pay attention. All right. So, man, a lot to digest that, but very well answered. Uh, one thing I would like to add on is it seems tape filters out a certain type of people so if someone who adamantly hates hate won't be joining the real world so already you have something in common with the people who have joined and just like no matter what you think of hate, just having something in common already brings you closer to someone so now there's a whole community of people with at least one thing in common but then there's all this positive all these positive lessons and you're surrounding yourself with people who are working on themselves financially physically in all areas of life and being around them motivates you to do the same as well. So, so yeah, it is very interesting what what has happened. And again, it's it just seems like because of tape being a filter for that. Do you see it that way as well, or would you have a different perspective? I do. Uh, going back to my earlier point, one of the greatest disservices that has been done to him is that people took short clips of things that were said years ago, and you know. When you, when you do that to someone, you, you don't want to associate with someone you strongly disagree with, right? I think now, obviously, this is a problem of our modern world is that they can't look at someone and agree or disagree with what a person says. You know, either they hear something that they don't like and they completely disagree with everything he says, or they hear one thing that they like and they agree with everything that that, that person says. I think that's a completely wrong way to look at the world. And I think that that's you know, primarily what was happening. And I think that was accelerated with the amount of short clipped content of things that were said years ago that he just doesn't even agree with. He corrected himself a few times on things that he's changed his, his mind on. And, you know, this might sound crazy. This is a very crazy theory that I'm going to put out there. Uh, are you familiar with Malcolm X? Yeah. So I, I, I read Malcolm X's book and that really uh, opened my mind to like how impactful of a character Malcolm X was at the time. But people hated Malcolm X at the time. He was a villain. It's not until now in this era that we're in now that people look at Malcolm X and say, wow, he changed the world. But here's the thing that people don't know about Malcolm X. Malcolm X was went through many different phases in his life. So he went through a phase where he got, you know, uh, was around the wrong crowd and doing the wrong things. And then he went into meeting a new group of people, power of proximity. And then he met a new group of people and they changed again. So he was going through all these different changes as he was impacting the world in the ways that he did. And in many ways, there's a lot of parallels to Malcolm X and Tate. Like we're going to be looking at this period of time that we're in down the road. You want to talk about equity, inclusion. You want to talk about um, economic access. Those are things that, you know, Malcolm X was advocating for and, you know, did it make sense until years later. And now we're in this new era where things don't make sense and we're trying to make sense of it. We're going to be looking at this period of time and how Andrew Tate influenced our world today. And we we're like, wait, he was right. Right. Uh, vast majority of heroes are villains while they're being heroic. Right. And so the people who disagree with Tate, which, and I was absolutely one of them. And don't get me wrong. There are still things that I disagree with Tate on. Obviously, that requires judgment and critical thinking to be able to say, hey, look, this person is speaking. Let me listen to them, understand them, and take what I want from them and then disregard them. But that's a side note. I think once you really understand that um, the things Tate is doing in our society today are not going to be agreed upon by the vast majority of people, especially in our society today, because of the disservice that the 
you know, the, the large organizations that have control over, um, you know, the way we perceive media are going to put them out to be right. And that's obviously a disservice, but down the road, things are going to change because the, the truth always reveals itself. And the same way that the media made Malcolm X a long time ago, look like a criminal and, you know, point him out to be amongst the disenfranchised and in, uh, intellectually incapable is the same way that we're going to be looking at Andrew Tate today. I'm going to give you some actually really important piece of information to, you know, help you understand how impactful Malcolm X was and why I think this really relates to where Andrew Tate is. Do you know what the Oxford Union is? No. The Oxford Union is basically, so people used to debate at the Oxford Union. It was a, de, you know, a debate that took place with the most intellectual, intelligent people of all time. That's what the Oxford Union was. Malcolm X had no college or university degree. He was in jail for seven years. He, um, he lost his father in the worst of ways when he was very young, maybe you think it was 13 or 14, you know, someone could correct me on that. Worst possible scenario of life, like the worst cards you could imagine. You understand what I'm saying? And he debated at the Oxford Union with PhDs. Do you understand how impactful that is? That's like, that's like saying you're from South side of Chicago or Luton, okay? And getting on PBD's podcast. That's basically what it is and getting 14 million views. It's, it's very, it's very similar in terms of timing or perhaps getting on Piers Morgan or perhaps, you know, being invited to almost every single talk show that is probably out there. That's what it's equivalent to. That's what the Oxford Union is. So look at the odds of Malcolm X's life and look at the odds of Andrew Tate's life. Anyone who is in my opinion, after reading Malcolm X's biography, in, in that way, similar. It's very similar. That to me is someone I'm going to at least pay a little bit of attention to. A very interesting comparison I haven't heard before. But yeah, I mean, something I'll look into more myself because that does seem very interesting, what you have said. <clears throat> and as for being seen as a villain now, I mean, it just seems like we are in nature tribal people and I mean hive mind I think is quite a prevalent thing in society so if you're someone who disturbs the norm then it is normal for people to instantly reject of course what you're disturbing yeah I'll give you another example sorry I, I want to hear a little bit more on your thoughts on that but just one other example the prophet Muhammad when he revealed revelation People threw garbage at him. People said, you are a magician, you're a phony. Please stop what you're preaching. Now Islam is the most, one of the most followed religions in the world. There's about 25% of the population and people are moving towards Islam in masses. So it kind of gives you perspective about what you just said there, where it's like, when you're disturbing the norm of what is happening in society, what we're supposed to be thinking, what we're programmed to think, once you start to tinker that thought process a little bit, it's a really challenging world to be a part of. Like your, your access to opportunity almost ceases, right? And that's why like it, it, it is something worth considering. Like what you put out on the internet is out there forever. And so if you put an Instagram post, if you put a Twitter post, that sticks, right? And so people are very careful with what they say, myself included. I would be, you know, lying if I didn't say I'm very thoughtful with what I say and what I put out there. Um, but I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now in, in terms of people trying to build their own lives. It's like, how could I share my thoughts on what is right and what is wrong if I'm attached to um, 
an organization or a group or a community that will shun me if I say something wrong, right? It's the idea of people unable to decipher opinions and, and thoughts and unable to agree or disagree without completely being uh, canceled, shunned, whatever you want, whatever term you want to use. Just a side note there. Just wanted to add to that. So just one more tangent on a personal level, what kind of an impact has they had on you? Oh, you know, I'll give you an example of what kind of impact he had. Maybe a better husband. I'll tell you that. Uh, made me understand clearly things that uh, I should be applying in my own life that I wasn't before. Like simple things. The importance of, you know, shaking a hand firmly, looking at someone in the eyes, uh, you know, not being sloppy, uh, protecting your environment, your subconscious, uh, making sure that you're surrounded by people who want to impact the world the way you want to impact the world. That alone really like, like sometimes you come across someone and you say, Oh, you know, whatever. I kind of grew up with them and they're my friend, but then you realize, wait, no, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like that alone, like being able to have the understanding of curating your reality and your environment to get what you want out of life. Like at the end of the day, we're, we're mere travelers in this, in the, in this world. We're coming through, we're passing through and then life goes on. But how do you make the best out of, out of that experience so that, you know, once it ends, you look back and say, I made the right decisions. I did the right thing. And I, and a huge part of the impact you're going to have on your life is how is your companion going to be thinking about you? How is your community going to be thinking about you? How is the work that you did in the world going to be thinking about you? The idea of legacy, the way Tate really explained it was the thing that really changed my mind. It's like, whoa, understanding that you have a leg a, a duty towards legacy that like, we don't really think about that. Oh, wait, I have a duty to make sure that I'm around the best possible people. Wait, I, I know, I know that, but maybe I, I wasn't taking that seriously. And like, I'm fortunate enough to have a fair understanding of that based on my hard experiences, you know, up until this point, but imagine being 18. That's kind of where I was putting my shoes. I was like, wait, what about the young folks who don't really have someone to look up to, who don't really have someone to tell them how to live their lives in a way that they actually have a chance at the world. Like I, I come across some young folks, Gen Z, and that's partly why I created 20 esque which is my learning platform uh, that failed uh, around giving Gen Z and millennials the skills that they need is because, you know, people don't understand the importance of actually having a firm handshake or smiling in an interview or being able to walk with your shoulders back or being able to, you know, really filter out bad environments and try to be around good people or the importance of actually giving it your all and working hard at something that matters. People don't really understand that, right? I kind of understood it and I got value out of listening to Tate from this. And so, Again, I want to make my position very clear. When I first started listening to him, I, I put him aside. I said, this, this person, you know, what, what is he saying? And then I started listening to his long form content. And then I started listening to more of his podcasts. I said, whoa, this is the information I needed to hear. This is the content that I needed to make some changes in my life. I can't imagine being the 18 year old, right? So I think, uh, you know, you look at the impact. It's like, look, my, I'll, I won't, I won't, I won't call Tate a role model. He could, because he's not, but you know, I look up to, uh, clear figures from, you know, my own personal faith as role models. Those are the only people that I will ever label as a role model. But I look at Tate as someone that I will listen to and take what the good and leave the things that I don't agree with. 
But I'll say that listening to them does help your life. It helps you understand things that are being excluded from the narrative that are worth listening to. And the things that he's sharing is not novel and new. It's actually classic and traditional. And that's, I think, where the power comes from. It's like, be a good person, help others, you know, make the world a better place, work as hard as you possibly can at a goal worth looking into. We need more people to do that. So you could agree with him or disagree with him all you like, but what he's talking about is the, the things that society today needs the most. He's impacted me in that way. He's impacted many others in that way. And even if you, you want to say he doesn't impact you, he di indirectly impacts you just from actually listening to the, the way that he's, you know, changing the perceptions of others and changing uh, the narrative that, that exists today in our society. So I can say on a personal level as well, that change, I mean, that Tate did change my life. And it says you're saying you need critical thought in, I mean, every area of your life, like no matter what someone is telling you, you still need to have that filter through which you process before taking it into your mind, because anything you consume ends up staying in your mind as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that critical thinking is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on to, let's go back to the real world. What would you say have been the three biggest lessons you've learned from your time within it? Storytelling for sure. Hands down. Life-changing. That's one. I'm also in the copywriting uh, um, campus, and I found that quite impactful as well in terms of being able to influence. Because here's the, thing, here's the unique thing about what's being taught in copywriting. It's not just teaching you how to write persuasively, but it's teaching you the psychology of humans and why they are perceiving it in this way. That, that clear distinction, that bridge, game changer. It's like, wait, when I'm writing, whether it's a persuasive email for a deal that I'm trying to close, whether it's, you know, a text message to my wife to, you know, help her think about something differently, you know, or even if it's, um, you know, a, a, a blog post or, you know, a social media post. I'm now putting myself in the writer's shoes or the reader's shoes in terms of human emotion, not in terms of like how they're going to read it. Everyone does that. But in terms of human emotion, what are they going to be feeling? What chords am I going to be stringing? When I learned that piece of information, Game changer. So storytelling, the human psychology of perceiving information and relationship building. The, those three for me, like the importance of, you know, okay, who, who are the people that you bring onto your team? You know, how do you uh, manage a team? Uh, you know, these concepts were all included in Arno and Tate's uh, business mastery um, in many different, like this topic is, referred to in many different uh, uh, lessons. So it's not just one clear lesson on that topic, but it's referred to in multiple. It's like re-hitting that point home and giving it to you in a different understanding in relationship to this specific lesson. So um, as much as I would love to say, it's this one lesson that changed my life, this 10 minutes, it's not really that. It's more like uh, higher level topics, higher level domains around those three areas. Like storytelling is referred to multiple times in, in, in these lessons and teaching it to you multiple times, both in business mastery, then it kind of moved into the personal finance group. And then it's also taught in copywriting. So it's like, I wouldn't talk about it as lessons. I would talk about it as human skills. What are the human skills that you really got out of this? Right? We're now moving into this generation of AI, right? Like, Oh my God, chat GPT can basically write better than 80% of people. Okay. Well, that's great. You could use these tools and it all, by the way, it actually teaches you how to leverage AI in the era that we're in today with writing. So that to me alone, especially like since chat GPT came out, it was like, okay, this is, this is pretty remarkable. This, this is some really good stuff. So 
understanding technology was also a, an impact there. But let me go back to my point, which is, you know, we're getting into a world where almost everything is going to be impacted by technology if it is already. You know, a robot will probably be smarter than you in the vast majority of ways that you could possibly think of, whether it's coding, mathematics, uh, uh, writing, articulating thoughts, you name it. But I'll give you an example. For years, people used to ride elephants and horses. An elephant and a horse can basically, you know, back kick us and send us to, you know, to, to Mars, right? You know, they'll set, end us right then and there. But, you know, elephants are still being ridden. You know, they used to be at least much more so. And horses are still being ridden. People are riding these animals. And it's fascinating to see how these animals are letting us use them for other types of uh, human needs. You know, you understanding technology in that way obviously was really impactful in the real world, but also understanding that as long as we're still human, as long as we still consider ourselves homo sapiens, technology and AI is all going to be doing the things that, you know, humans were doing with technology and AI more so quicker, faster, uh, and clearer. So where does that put humans? Well, humans are now going to be moving towards doing human things. And if we're doing human things, what are the human skills that we're learning? The human skills that we're learning are the things that are actually being taught in the real world that have been forgotten because we've been so focused on trying to figure out this technology stuff. You understand what I'm saying? So like when we understand that a lot of business is three key things, it's selling, which by the way, that's another topic that <laughs> the real world really, really impacted me with selling, being able to sell better. That alone was a game changer. That's another topic. Building, which is taught in the real world. It teaches you how to build a product, how to build a business, how to build a new stream of income, how to build a company. And leading, which is taught in the fantastic human skills that are included in the real world. So the three things that move our economy forward, selling, building, and leading, are all included in multiple lessons in the real world. <laughs> Crazy, right? It's not like, oh, I, like if I were Andrew Tate, I'd rebrand this thing. I wouldn't say we teach you many ways to generate income streams. Sure, it does that, but that's a byproduct. What it actually does is it teaches you how to survive in the era of technology. In the three areas that are necess necessary to be able to survive, which is selling. You either have to sell a product, you either have to build a product, or you have to lead a team. And if you could do all three, which are all taught in the real world, triple threat, you're LeBron James right then and there. You understand what I mean? Like it's, it's remarkable. And I'm actually kind of happy that it's only 200,000. Like you take a look at other learning platforms. It's, we're looking at the hundreds of millions of users. This is only 200,000 people. That means you're looking at building the 0.1% of people. The people who are actually have the guts and the curiosity and the open mind, whether it's a joke to join in or originally or whether it's, um, you know, you're actually taking this seriously because you resonate with something that you heard from, you know, the folks who are marketing this. You're, you're joining this platform out of, you know, a need to learn the things that are going to help you, you know, survive in the next era. If you do these three things, you, you have a chance, right? Like we're going to probably go towards, in my opinion, you know, I could be completely wrong and I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're going to be going towards a world where we have universal basic income. If we have universal basic income, why do I need to work? And here, people say like, wait, oh, that's not too bad. Universal basic income isn't too bad. Let me give it to you how bad it is. Okay. So uh, there's a really good podcast out there. Uh, I don't want to name drop them. They interviewed Justin Bieber's doctor, okay? They asked him, if you want to destroy your brain, what do you do? Like, I'm about to bring this point home really, really hard. So stay with me here. If you want to destroy your brain, what do you do? And he mentioned uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, we, we already know if you actually listen to some of the things that 
Tate includes in the lessons. He talks about his manager who was on drugs and alcohol and how that destroyed his business career. That's a lesson. That alone is a lesson included. So he's basically teaching you in that first lesson, you know, protect your brain. The second thing, loneliness. Loneliness destroys your brain. Loneliness is not just a companion. It's a community. It's a group of friends taught in the real world. Uh, the third thing is if you, if you want to actually really destroy your brain, he said, this, this doctor says, drop out of school. Don't learn anything. The whole platform is a learning platform, right? You have to learn in that platform to be able to be included in the platform. You have to be engaged in the platform to be still part of it in many ways. And the game theory that is included in that, like winning the coins, like that enhances learning, right? I could go on, but I just wanted to mention these three things. These three things that are basically the way to save your brain. Well, let's take a look at the alternative. Universal basic income destroys these three things because if I have too much time, the idle mind is a devil's workshop. I'm probably going to be drinking more, smoking more, doing more drugs, probably get into some bad things that I shouldn't be doing, some bad addictions if I have too much time. Um, I'm not around a group of people at work. I'm not part of something that's very lonely. But even if you'd have a partner or not, it's still very lonely and pretty damaging. And I'm not learning. And so basic universal basic income is basically a path to destroy your brain. Learn to build, sell, or lead and keep your brain alive. And maybe your human existence won't be so miserable or so terrible. Right? That's how I look at it, at least. Like in, in comparison to understanding where the world is going. It's saving a lot of humanity right now. Because other learning platforms will teach you one skill and maybe you can use that skill and it's a digital skill and you can go and apply that skill, but it doesn't solve the problem of, of where the world is going because that skill that you're learning, eventually a robot will be smart enough to do it. And then you have to keep going back and learning a different skill. And you know, you're in this wheelhouse of, okay, I got a job. Okay. I got laid off. I got a job. I got laid off. Okay. I got a job. Now I'm getting, okay. Universal basic income for a bit. Okay. I got it. You're in this wheelhouse, but the real world is different. The real, real world is basically you can learn everything on the real world. Give it a year, never go back to the real world and you'll probably be set for life. That's the, that's the clear difference. It's not a recurring platform, but people will stay because they want to be part of the community and they want to share their journey, right? That's what makes it such a fantastic product. People don't understand this. They don't understand it because other, you know, traditional SaaS companies or learning companies, the, the clear focus is recurring revenue. And if the people designed this product, wanted to make that happen, they easily could, but they don't care about that. I think that they care about solving the world's greatest problems, which is the brain being destroyed with the way that technology will essentially be replacing us in many ways. If it doesn't, if it hasn't already learn to build, learn to lead, learn to sell. You learn those three things in the real world, you know, lifelong skills, you leave the real world, you go, you start building your thing or joining a group of people who will build that thing. And you actually have a recipe for life on how to stay on top of things, stay on top of your own career and your own world. That's a clear distinction between the real world and other learning problems, uh, other learning platforms. Other learning platforms want you to keep learning and stay on that platform forever. The real world doesn't need you to be there forever. They need you to go learn, get out, figure out the problems of the world. It's interesting the contrast between a platform which is people-centered, just focusing on improving people's lives, and then another one which is income-centered, just more income for whether it's shareholders or for the board members, whatever. So yeah, the, that contrast there, as in what kind of a platform could be built with that contrast is interesting, is what you're saying. So yeah. Totally. Okay, so since you're on this trajectory now, where do you see your life heading in six months to one year? 
Well, I'm going to be starting to share a lot more content myself. Uh, you know, I, I was listening to this YouTuber. I also won't mention him because I, I don't know if he wants to be mentioned. And he said, it took me four years to finally get started on my thing, to learn that thing that will help me start my life. And then it took me 10 hours to actually do the thing that got me started. I would say my life is in many ways similar where it's like, I used to share a lot of content. Then I started my learning platform and then it failed. And then I got discouraged and I always told myself, maybe I'm going to get back into it. Maybe I'm going to start sharing more content, you know, whether it's a YouTube platform, whether it's sharing content on LinkedIn or Twitter, but sharing things that will actually help people. Like, I, I really think I got that from, from Tate and from the real world. It's like, man, my content is worthy. My content can survive in this, you know, plethora of content era. I, I am capable of putting things out there that will resonate with people. I'm able to speak well to people and ensure that, you know, what I'm saying resonates. I have that skill. Why have I not done it yet? And now it's like, I'm finally starting. You know, I'm not going to share all the details of how I'm starting that, but I'm starting now. And it's, and it's exciting because I, I've been holding out for so long on finally getting started on the thing that ultimately would make me really happy in my life. And sure, I'm probably going to still have my nine to five until it no longer is suitable. But I'm able to now think of the future, the next year, the next two years. And like, I, I actually want to reframe what you're saying. What do you, where do you see your life taking place in the next six months? Like the thing that I'm going to start building now is not necessarily the thing for the next six months. It's the thing that I want to start doing for the next years because I kind of now have the confidence to say, look, even if this thing doesn't succeed, like my last business didn't succeed and I dropped it after 18 months. Now it's like, no, you're playing the long game. You're now putting it like we, we don't like this is actually the thing that really resonated with with me around Tate and his content. He was putting things out for like five years before even anyone paid attention. Right. And so like that longevity, that idea of mission and vision, well, that's what I really took out of it. And that I have to re re go back to my mission and vision. And that, sure, maybe being part of a company helped that a little bit, but you're still just serving a, a, a group of shareholders. You're not really serving your own mission. And so I think now where I see my life going is I'm actually going to finally start to do the thing that I really want to do for that's going to, that's going to have longevity. And I'm going to be learning the skills that I need to be able to make sure that it doesn't fail like my last business, putting out content, sharing out information that I think helps people understand their careers and, you know, opportunity for, for themselves. Um, I think that's where it's going to go. And I think I'm going to hopefully, I mean, hope's not a strategy, but I'm trying to be humble here. I'm, I think I'm going to be doing pretty well at it. Um, and I think I have the confidence now that I need that I didn't have before to be able to feel like my content will compete in the world of massive free content. All right. Okay. And I look forward to doing a follow up with you in future as well, if you'll be willing to see how things are progressing, because you are a very good speaker, very good orator. So when you start putting content out, it will be interesting to see how the progress is there. And for my final question, <clears throat> for people who are still unsure about joining the real world, maybe they're thinking it's a scam for $50. What advice would you have to them? Go into anything in your life, whether it's the real world or anything else with an open mind and then make your judgment that way before you decide something is a scam and label it as a scam. Come up with your own conclusions as opposed to going through what people have told you to think. That would be my advice to them. And that applies to the real world and that applies to anything else. Make your own conclusion as opposed to following someone else's um, narrative. All right. Okay. So Ralph, thank you very much for your time. Almost one hour. I think the, yeah, it will be between 50 minutes to one hour video. So again, thank you for all your knowledge, all your insights, everything. 
and I look forward to that follow-up again, if you'll be willing to do it. And until then, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Appreciate your time.